today's scripture reading is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 to 40. So Saul clothed David with his armour, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armour and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk in these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Uncle Richard, for this story. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> it was good. And I was wondering, I think that we all more prefer Coco Pops than Coco Rocks. <laughs> uh, okay, so now it's time for to share God's Word together. You heard the scripture reading this morning from 1 Samuel chapter 17. And uh, I would like to start this bit with one question. If someone asks you, how is your spiritual life going? What you would answer? I just would like to give you some time to think. Up and down. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting how we as Christians, how we measure our Christian growth of spiritual life. I'm sure that when I, me- when I asked the question, some ideas that came to your mind was, okay, so I just would like to go how much I was reading spiritual things this week. Or how, how much I was praying. Or was I involved in something spiritual? And based on that, we would be able to give answer where we are spiritually currently. Is that true or not? And I know that some people, when listen to different sermons at church, they get confused with different, I would call them spiritual prescriptions, you know. Uh, You hear all different ideas, what you need to do in order to be spiritually healthy or to to spiritually grow. And I think sometimes, as I said, people get confused because uh, after the sermon, people go home and they said, okay, now... From next week, I will read more my Bible. From next week, I'll pray more. For next week, I'm going to the bookstore and I'm going to buy a pile of books, you know, and I'm going to be a really good Christian. Is that works like that? Um, you heard of word consumerism. We live in a world of consumer society. And you know what is interesting? We live in a world where there is consumer Christianity. When we are tempted to think, if we do things more, ultimately we will be better Christians. But that not works always like that. Sometimes we are hearing stories like some people getting up at five in the morning to pray and study their Bibles. And you feel guilty, probably, some of you, because you don't do that. And that's happened to me several years ago. I was invited to preach at one church. And in the, in the back room, before we would come uh, for the service, we had a prayer there. And there was a couple who shared the story with us. And they said, in order to be spiritual and healthy, spiritually healthy Christian, you need to wake up very early to spend time with God and with His Word. And they said we 
waking up every morning, my husband and I, and we start our worship at 4.30 in the morning. And as a pastor, I had a bit guilt because that's not me. And, and I was thinking, you know, look, these people, they must be more spiritual than me, you know, because they wake up so early. And I try to do that. But you know what? At 5.30 in the morning, I'm very groggy and grumpy. And no one likes to be around me. Not even Jesus would like to be around me at, at 4.30 in the morning. And simply, it doesn't work for me. And I know that it doesn't work for some other people. The question for this morning is, is there a unique pattern for each individual person that we should follow and spiritually grow? Is this is something that works for everyone? So as you heard from Josh this morning, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 to 40. So we see from these verses that we read, and we know that David was preparing for the biggest battle in his life. He was going to face a biggest bully ever. Goliath. And at, at first, it was a big surprise for everyone that uh, David decided to do so. And when they realized that this is from the Lord, they tried to support him. And the king, King Saul, Saul he was there to be the first to support this young man. And then Saul, he made mistake that we often make as we going through our battles in our lives. He thought that whatever would be helpful to him would also help David. Bible tells us that it didn't work. And when it talks about Saul, there was a big difference between Saul and other people. As you remember, when we're reading, I think, in chapter 9, that the Bible tells us the soul was, from his shoulders upward, taller than any other people. And can you imagine now this scene? So Saul brought his armor, his sword, his helmet, and he would like to prepare David for the, bat for the battle with his things. And as we read, uh, read, and as we know, it didn't suit David for several reasons. Saul was a man, David was a teenager. Saul was a warrior, David was a shepherd. The things that would help Saul in his battle would be burden for David. And Saul's robe didn't fit. His helmet was too big. His sword was too heavy. And his armor would only slow David down. And as we, as we know from the Bible, David took courage to name the problem and said, I cannot go in this because I'm not used to this. And he took slingshot and five stones and you know the rest of the story. And finally Saul ended up sending David with the best help actually he could give him. He said, go and the Lord will be with you. I was thinking, how often we are burdened in our spiritual life and spiritual battle because we try to use a weapons that have helped someone else's in their battles. We hear how someone else prays or read the Bible or worship or serves, as I mentioned before, and we feel guilty if we don't do the same. We get frustrated 
if something that helps for some other people doesn't work for us. In Ephesians chapter 6, Apostle Paul, as you remember, and I believe that as I speak this, someone will remember the verses from Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul says, put on the whole, what? Arm of God. That includes faith, truth, prayer, and peace. And I believe without any doubt, this will fit everyone. This will work for everyone, these four that, that I just mentioned. However, if David went into battle in Saul's armor, he would lose that battle. God knew what Saul needed. God knew what David needed. And God certainly knows what each one of us needs in our spiritual journey. Please join me opening Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and I would like to read verse 10. Very well known um, passage in the Bible. It's talking about that we are saved um, by grace through faith. And then in verse 10 in chapter 2 says, for we are his what? Work, it's my translation says, workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So according to Bible, we are all his, someone did mention in other translations, it's used work, masterpieces. We are all unique. And we all have different needs. When talk about uniqueness, I do remember some times ago, I will never forget actually this experience. We lived on the border of New South Wales and Victoria, a place called Wodonga. Our older son, he started playing his violin. And he started to school and he had a um, small violin, half size violin. And then he came to the stage that he needed to now upgrade his violin and to start playing full size violin. So we decided to buy a violin for him. However, Albury Wodonga is probably like these two towns like Rockhampton uh, in terms of population. So there was no much choices of violins. So we decided as a family to go and to drive in the morning to Melbourne and to buy a violin for Nick. So we did it. But it's, the worst thing is when you go somewhere but you don't know where you go. And, and when you don't know where you go, what you usually do? You Google, you know? So we put on Google a violin shop or something similar, Melbourne. And then you can imagine whoosh, the list. Which one to choose? We don't have enough time, you know, to go to every uh, shop. And we just randomly chose one shop. So we put address, and we went there. When we came there, uh, that was just like an ordinary house. It wasn't actually a proper shop. But the Google says that's the place. So we came out of the car, we went there, and we inquired, is that where you're selling violin? Oh, yes, please, come in. Okay. So we came in an ordinary nice house and we ended up in, in a room, big room, with so many violins. But there was no price, just violins, you know. How we can help you? 
and we explained that our son is playing violin, he needs first, uh, his first uh, full-size violin, etc. And then the man who was there said, okay, so would you like to try this? But all violins, they look the same to me. I could pick any violin, you know? But he gave Nick one violin. And Nick started playing, and it sounded great. I was ready to buy the first one. But to my surprise, when I asked how much this violin cost, the answer was $2,000. And you know what, when you're uncomfortable, you just start scratching your head. And I don't know how to go out of this situation. And then he saw that I was thinking, he said, oh, would you like to try another one? Oh, yes, please. So he gave Nick another violin, and he started playing beautifully. I said, oh, that sounds good. So how much is the violin? I said, this one is $3,500. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, please help me to get out of this situation. And you know what? You need to learn something about our culture. When we don't have money, we won't tell you, you know? I wouldn't say, oh, that's too expensive for us. We don't have money. But I was trying to find, you know, a way how to escape of the situation. But I was embarrassed to ask, is there any cheaper violins? Because I realized that the cheapest one, he gave me the first one. And then I said, can we go try one more? Ah, yeah, sure. And then he picked another one and gave me similar violin as violin for, to me, you know. And he played and I asked for the price. That was over $5,000. And I said, look, thank you very much. So we need as a family to go out and to consult. Oh, no, Oris, thank you. So we didn't come back. But it took me time to realize why these violins were so expensive. And I found out the answer. Because all those violins that were given to us were handcrafted violins. They were not massively produced. They were carefully made by humans' hands. And that's something that makes them unique. And that's something that makes them special. When we think about ourselves, brothers and sisters, we are not God's appliances. We are his masterpieces. Because appliances, they get mass-produced, and masterpieces, they are handcrafted. And because of each one of us is created as a unique person, God's plan for us is to grow differently. And we need to understand and accept and tolerate this fact. Because... What would grow a flower would drown cactus? You know what I mean? What would feed a mouse would star an elephant? It is true that all of these mentioned need light, food, air, and water, but in different amount and different conditions. Imagine... You're going to see a doctor, and you are sick. And any time when you go to see a doctor, the doctor tells you, no worries, take, your, take two aspirins, and you'll be fine. Yeah, if you, if you have a headache, yeah, aspirins can temporarily give you relief, you know. But if your appendix is burst, and you give someone a, a aspirins, Oh, that would be terrible consequences. Imagine a shop that sells only one kind of shirt, one color, style, size. There is no one size fits all because God made people 
in different sizes. God never grows two people in the same way because God is handcrafter, not a mass producer. Now, when we understand our uniqueness, what we will need to be fully alive and to grow spiritually? So that's the question. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that we need something that is so missing nowadays. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And in order to have that power, we need to thirst for the Holy Spirit. Because without Holy Spirit, there is no growth. Open with me John chapter 7, Gospel of John chapter 7. I would like to read a few verses in, in that Gospel. John chapter 7, we read from verses 37 to 39. It says, On the last day, that great date of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus has promised in these verses that anyone thirsts and comes to him, he, she, they will experience difference in their life. They will grow. Out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. And to me, when I read these verses, it sounds like people will flourish when the Holy Spirit is present. And I believe that the only way we can flourish is when we are connected to the source of life, which is God. When we come to him, when his spirit is in with us. So when we are connect, disconnected from God, when, when we are disconnected from the source of life, what actually happens? What is the word contrary of flourishing? Languishing, is it? That's actually what's happened in Christian's life, Christian life, where we are not connected to God. When his spirit is not with us. However, each one of us is connecting to the source of life in different way. Some mothers with small children cannot connect with God early in the morning, but possibly late at night when kids are sleeping. Or someone doesn't like to read much, but can be connected through listening and watching and doing different other things. And I can tell you, I had in one church a member who was blind, couldn't read at all. But that member, church brother, he knew his Bible much better than some of those who had their eyes and he, who could read. So, according to Jesus, experiencing flow of the Spirit is what makes us alive. And the picture Jesus used for life in the Spirit is a river, as we, as we read. Rivers are used in the Bible often as a picture of spiritual life and for a good reason. Israel was a desert, so river is grace. When we read first pages from the Bible, we don't know much about the Garden of Eden. But we do know that a river ran throughout it. If a river flows, life flourishes. If a river dries up, Life dies. 
so it is with us and the Spirit of God. And there is another beautiful promise of Jesus about the power of the Holy Spirit in people's life. And we read this in the book of Acts chapter 1. We study book of Acts here at church every Wednesday. And if you remember, in chapter 1, verse 8, what Jesus said, but you will receive what? The power when the Spirit comes on you. And you will become my witnesses. In other words, when you receive that power, when you become my witness, you will be spiritually okay. You will be healthy Christians. You will flourish. So where we are, my brothers and sisters Christians, where we are when it comes to our spiritual life, are we flourishing or languishing? And I believe it is crucial for us today to understand this important question. Are we trying to walk around in somebody else's armor? Or are we connected with the Holy Spirit and winning the battles in our lives? There is a verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 which reminds us of the importance of living every day guided by the Holy Spirit. And at the end of his first epistle, in verse 19, chapter 5, Paul says, Do not quench the Spirit. I believe that the greatest need for us as Seventh-day Adventists is to be led by God, by the Holy Spirit. We have a knowledge. We know theoretically everything from the Bible. But we need to submit to the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us throughout our Christian life. I came to this country this year will be 14 years ago. When I came here, there was a lot of surprises. First surprise was to drive on the wrong side of the road. And when I started driving here, I was given a little thing that looks like my phone, which we called a GPS, General Positioning System. Prior to that, I never saw GPS. It was quite new to me. And when I opened that GPS, wow, that was an amazing thing. You could put the address, and GPS will help you to go anywhere you want. And to another surprise was, not just to show you where you need to go, but also to tell you with a voice, nice voice of a woman I named Martha. So I had a GPS, and Martha was talking to me through that, through that GPS. And I remember as, as a new, uh, new person who comes to Brisbane, that was in Brisbane, had no idea where I need to go, but with that GPS I felt really comfortable. Only what I needed to do is to put the address and GPS will lead me. And then I would end up at the address not having any idea how I came here. But after a month or so, I became confident and I start ignoring GPS. And I remember once I was driving and approaching a roundabout, and Martha told me, in a hundred meters at the roundabout, take a first exit left. 
And I thought, what? In 100 meters and at the roundabout, I will tur turn actually right, not left. Because I thought I knew. And I did. I turned right. And you know what Martha says? Recalculating roots. Make a U-turn when it's possible. And I kept going, and after a few moments, Martha will, any time when I would pass a street or something, Martha would recalculate the roots and ask me to make a U-turn when it's possible. And after a few minutes, I became annoyed by Martha. And you know what is the great thing about GPSs? You can always switch it off. And that's what I did. Be quiet. And then I was comfortable driving, driving for another several minutes. And then I came. I had no idea where did they come. I was lost. And guess what I did? I turned my GPS back again. And you know what Martha told me? You silly man. I'm not going to assist you anymore. Look after yourself now. No, she didn't tell that. You know what she said? Recalculating Ruth. Make a U-turn when it is possible. This is a really grace. Jesus is the only one with a wisdom about how to live and grow spiritually. When I say how to live, I mean how to flourish, to be fully alive. And he can only be the one with the right spiritual prescription. I would like to invite you this morning, my brothers and sisters, to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit. To allow him to lead you and guide you. Be sensitive towards his tiny voice. And when you know that that's from God, please follow that tiny voice. Because only with God we can reach our destination and we can spiritually grow. That's my prayer for myself and for each one of you. In Jesus' name, amen.